next four, I'm going to give you, a it has to be top line um, introduction or presentation on this very important category of disorders in the DSM-5. Um, and what I will try to do and what I hope you will learn in the process is the following. Number one, that you should have some sense of the classification of neurodevelopmental disorders as we have them in DSM-5. DSM-5, in fact, was the first time that all these particular group of conditions have been put together in one chapter. And I think that was a very important um, progression in the field of psychiatry and child and adolescent mental health. The second thing I want you to do is to understand why neurodevelopmental disorders are important to identify and to treat, and particularly to understand why the vicious, or what I might call the vicious cycle of difficulties that may come and that may co-occur with neurodevelopmental disorders. I'd like you to have a basic approach to diagnosis and treatment um, of one of these, I mean, broadly of all of them, but in particular of autism spectrum disorders. And so I'll spend a little bit of time just focusing on autism spectrum disorders or ASD as well. And finally, it will be important for you, regardless of where you may be in the world and what kind of practitioner or non-practitioner you may be to understand and know the red flags or the risk markers for autism spectrum disorders. So let's jump straight in. The group called Neurodevelopmental Disorders, or NDD, as you might hear me talk about, um, in DSM-5 is important for various reasons. Number one, as you can see, one in six children across the globe are likely to have one or more of these neurodevelopmental disabilities. So the, the rates, the prevalence is significant, and the burden associated with neurodevelopmental disabilities is very high. If we think about it, if you say, so what is a neurodevelopmental disorder? Well, number one, they are neurological in onset. Now, I, I don't quite like the word neurological in the sense, but these are disorders of the developing brain. So a neurodevelopmental growth or progression as it happens. And here what we're presenting are conditions that are associated with things that go wrong with um, brain development and progression as it unfolds. And because they're neurodevelopmental disorders, it means that they manifest or the onset is in the developmental period of the brain. Now, you will all know that the brain does major growth and development in the first few years of life, but it actually continues physical and structural development, at least into the mid-20s. So that's the neurodevelopmental period that we're particularly interested in. When we therefore talk about a disorder in the context of development, it means that it's important for all of us to have a sense of developmental norms, by which I mean what is typical development in order for us to be able to say that in this particular child or person, development is not typical. The third point about neurodevelopmental disorders is that they lead to impairment in personal or social or academic or occupational functioning. So there's a huge range of impacts. They're not all health specific impact, but as health practitioners, as people interested in the overall well-being of individuals, there are major domains of health, of social, of occupational, um, and of overall quality of life that can be affected by neurodevelopmental disorders. The group of neurodevelopmental disorders, as you will see, range from some very specific limitations in particular areas of of neurodevelopment, all the way to very global impairment in other areas. And so you will, as we go through the example, you will get a sense that some are very focused and some are broad. A point that I will come back to is that neurodevelopmental disorders very often co-occur um, with, with one another and with other things, as you will see. And when we look for possible neurodevelopmental disorders, we might see two possible groups of difficulties. First, we may see a deficit or a delay in a typical behavior, say, for instance, in language, it's slower, it's not quite bright. Um, or we may see the presence of atypical behaviors or unusual things, things we don't normally expect to see in a typically developing child or a typically developing brain. And again, as we talk through, listen to the differences between delay and deficit versus an unusual atypical manifestation. This will particularly be the case when we talk about autism. 
And the seventh important point, as I will come back to as well, is neurodevelopmental disorders act as clues for other medical problems. So whenever a health practitioner, whenever a doctor sees somebody, a nurse or anyone sees somebody who comes with a neurodevelopmental disorder, the immediate thought in our mind needs to be, this might be a marker for other things that I should also look for, identify and treat. So on the right-hand panel, you can see the main categories of neurodevelopmental disorders as defined in DSM-5, intellectual disabilities, communication disorders, autism spectrum disorder or ASD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or you might hear me talk about it as ADHD, specific learning disorders, motor disorders, and there's always a box for other neurodevelopmental disorders. What I'm going to do now is just briefly explain what each of these categories mean and what we look for very top level. And then we will go into more specifics around other aspects. So the first of those categories is intellectual disability or intellectual disabilities. And this is where we see a, another nice word is intellectual developmental disorder. We see an, a different pattern of emergence of intellectual skills. And that includes all aspects of development, reasoning, problem solving, planning, language, judgment, all those kinds of things. And, and this delay in development um, is associated with an impact in adaptive behaviors, in the day-to-day -day skills of that person and in therefore having an impact on their personal development, on their ability to, to function in, in daily life. There's one group in the DSM that's called global developmental delay. And the only point to make about that is global developmental delay is a temporary or a provisional label that we should use only in children under the age of five and only when we are not yet able to make a comprehensive assessment of the intellectual level of a particular child. So let's say, a mother brings a two or three-year-old and it looks as though across the board all developmental milestones are delayed and the child seems to be um, delayed across their ability to problem solve and plan and talk and so on. We may say this looks like a development, a global developmental delay and at some point we need to do formal evaluation of their intellectual ability and a more systematic evaluation of their adaptive function. And once we do that, we will make the decision, do they have an intellectual disability or do they have something else that explains their presentation? So remember, this is a, only a provisional label and we should never use it over the age of five. So let me explain just in a minute then how we evaluate the intellectual abilities of a person. On the screen here, you can see what one calls the normal distribution of intellectual abilities. Um, this, some people call this the Gaussian curve or the bell-shaped curve. And the simple thing is that IQ tests, wherever we are in the world, different countries, different languages, use different kinds of tools. But an IQ type test measures the overall brain skills of an individual in comparison to other people of the same age. And so if we imagine, if we take 100 people, and put them in a room and see how tall people are. You will know that most people will be sort of of average height. So imagine that's height, most people are average height. Some people will be much taller and some people might be much shorter. And IQ works in exactly the same way. So that the mean IQ, the average IQ, once people have done a typical IQ test is 100. And you can see this, the middle, so one, plus one standard deviation away from this mean and minus one standard deviation away from this mean. This is average IQ. So 85 to 115 is an average IQ range. You can be above average if you fall in this group and you can be below average if you fall in this group. And then if your intellectual ability, if the scores you get on that IQ test falls below two standard deviations of the mean or below a score of 70. In other words, that only about 2% of people in the general population will fall in that group typically. Then we may say you have intellectual disability. 
And we will only say it also if you also have evidence of problems in your adaptive behavior. So this very broadly is how we get to a definition of intellectual disability. And this is why it's important for us to do more structured and formal testing and look at the adaptive behaviors of an individual to make that final clinical judgment. Communication disorders is the second group. This is where we're talking about a range of aspects of communication that might be affected. So language is the main modality of communication. And we may see language disorders of receptive, so understanding language, of expression of language, of both expression and receptive language. And often people say, well, maybe somebody's just a late talker, maybe it's not a language deficit. But the short answer is, if anybody is worried about the understanding or the expression of language in a child, it's better to seek support than to wonder and to assume uh, or to say, oh, my husband, my other son was also a slow talker, let's just wait. In neurodevelopmental disorders, it's always better not to wait and to do something than not to do anything. A second group of communication disorders is speech sound disorders. So we call them problems with articulation or phonology. So the ability to articulate and pronounce words. So that's a second group of um, communication disorders. Children, many children might have fluency disorders. So that's when they stutter, they stammer, they struggle to start, and they have to start again or in the middle of a word or particular sounds. We also get a category called social pragmatic communication disorders. So this is when people struggle with the pragmatics of language and pragmatics of language mean the social use of language. So for instance, struggling with indirect language, not understanding humor or sarcasm, or um, if I, for instance, were to say, well, it's raining cats and dogs, somebody who has a social pragmatic disorder might be looking for the cats and the dogs um, while it's raining and they don't quite understand that it has a different sort of meaning. This is a category that's in DSM but from a clinical point of view, whenever you see somebody who may have these sorts of social difficulties in communication, we're always going to think of autism spectrum disorders first, because many people who have these difficulties actually have an autism spectrum disorder. So I'll come back to that. Autism spectrum disorder is the third main category of neurodevelopmental disorders in DSM-5, and I'll come back and spend more time specifically just talking about that. ADHD. Many people have heard of ADHD. Some people think there's too much ADHD in the world, but in the USA, probably about 5% of children meet criteria for ADHD. Some studies that have been done in Africa show very similar rates. In fact, some have been even higher than that 5% um, that have, has been identified in the USA. And we get either predominantly inattentive presentation of ADHD. So a child is predominantly struggling to focus, struggling to pay attention, struggling to sustain their attention, etc. Or it might be predominantly hyperactive or impulsive, the child or the person who butts in, who finds it hard to sit still, who's really on the go, etc. Of course, all neurodevelopmental disorders also go into adulthood. And as we, our focus today is on the child and adolescent population, but as these conditions go into adulthood, they may start to present slightly differently. We may look for different things. So today's presentation is not specifically focused on neurodevelopmental disorders and how they may present in adults. We might get combined presentation of both inattentive and hyperactive subtypes of ADHD as well. The next main group of NDDs are specific learning disorders. These are things that are often picked up in school, in educational settings. And this is when a child, out of keeping with the expectation of their intellectual ability that we've talked about, and out of keeping with their educational opportunities, have difficulty in reading, and it could be many aspects of reading, like accuracy or rate or fluency or understanding. They might have difficulty with writing, also different aspects of writing can be affected, or they may have difficulty with mathematics, um, numbers, memorizing, figuring things out, etc. And just out of interest, people often hear and use the word dyslexia, and many people think dyslexia is associated with lots of different things, but strictly speaking, dyslexia really just means an inability or an impairment in reading. So from a, from a practical diagnostic point of view, that's what we mean. And so specific learning disorders are reading, 
writing mathematics. Motor disorders. This is a group where we see unusual or atypical development of motor skills in a child. And the one group that we see is called developmental coordination disorders. Um, and this is where a child typically might have some problems with their gross motor skills, they're a bit out, uncoordinated, they might have some more fine motor difficulties as well, building, running, jumping, hopping, etc. Um, and these can be very mild and subtle, or they can be actually very noticeable and lead to significant impairment in daily activities for children. We also get so-called stereotypical movement disorders. This is when a child might have very particular unusual movements that they, that they might make. Um, it might be hand and finger movements, um, although that might, might make us think of autism as well. It might be kind of ringing movements. It might be biting movements. They're very stereotypical and repetitive. And if they are not part of another condition like autism, we often actually see them in the context of conditions like intellectual disability or specific genetic syndromes, for instance. Tick disorders. Tick disorders when we have sudden, rapid, unexpected um, movements of either motor skills or functions or of sounds. And we can get a provisional tick disorder. So this is when we have either unusual motor movements like a blink or a tick or a twitch um, for less than a year or make unusual sounds like a <clears throat> throat clearing or <clears> throat> cough or, or whatever, any of those kinds of things, um, or many combinations of those for less than a year. If we have a persistent or a chronic tic disorder, it means we have either a motor or some vocal tics that last for more than a year. And we might meet criteria for Tourette's disorder if we have both motor tics and vocal or phonic tics that last more than a year. These are all very specialized areas, and there are many things that you can go and read about more about these conditions if you're interested. So let me now come back to why these neurodevelopmental disorders are important and what I mean by the vicious cycle of neurodevelopmental disorders. And I'm going to illustrate it by giving you some um, clinical numbers. The first important thing for all of us to remember is that, and if we use intellectual disability as an example, is that about 40% of children and adolescents who have an intellectual disability will have a diagnosable other mental health disorder. In contrast to that, a child and an adolescent without intellectual disability will have about an 8% likelihood of having another mental health, um, diagnosable mental health condition. So you can see, if you have intellectual disability, you are six times more likely to have other mental health disorders. They're treatable, but very often people don't look for them and therefore don't treat them. And that's the key message to all of us today, that if we see neurodevelopmental disorders, we should think, what can I do to help or to treat? Neurodevelopmental disorders often co-occur with one another. If I use the intellectual ability, intellectual disability example again, if you have ID, your chance of having autism is 33 times greater than if you don't have intellectual disability. Your chance of having ADHD as well is eight times greater. Of ticks is five times greater. So having intellectual disability is a major risk marker for other neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, ADHD, or tick disorders, for example. Neurodevelopmental disorders, as if that's not enough, they also co-occur with other psychiatric disorders, as I've already hinted at. So here you can see the intellectual disability example. You are four times more likely to have an anxiety disorder if you have intellectual disability, three times more likely to have a psychotic disorder, five, almost six times more likely to have conduct disorder. So the neurodevelopmental disability makes us more at risk of other psychiatric disorders. To compound that, neurodevelopment disorders are also associated with environmental adversity. The same author, um, Emerson, that you saw earlier on the slides, um, did large-scale studies in the UK and found the high rates of poverty in families who live with intellectual disability, the high rates of maternal mental health problems if you live with intellectual disability, the high rates of maternal physical health problems 
if you live with intellectual disability. There are more single parents who have kids with intellectual disability. And there are high rates of what they call chaotic families. So this is disrupted, interrupted, um, inconsistent families when you have intellectual disability. And finally, neurodevelopmental disorders are also associated with more physical health problems. When you have eye intellectual disability or autism, we see much higher rates of epilepsy, about 30% in intellectual disability and in autism, with increases in adolescence. We see much higher rates of diabetes, of dental and oral problems, of gastrointestinal difficulties like ulcers and reflux and constipation, and of obesity. Now that might be associated with a combination of their activity levels, difficulty with exercise, dietary things, medications, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what I wanted to illustrate to you is how and why neurodevelopmental disorders therefore poses the risk of what I call the vicious cycle of having one neurodevelopmental disorder that might lead to others that might be associated with mental health problems, with physical health problems, with family health, mental and physical health problems, with environmental challenges, with poverty, with lack of access to support. And this is why neurodevelopmental disorders are so important for us to think about, to be mindful of, um, and to think how do all sectors in health, in education, in social care, in the nonprofit sector, and so on. How do all of us play a role in breaking the cycle at some point along the way? And that, I think, in terms of the top line for neurodevelopmental disorders, if you can imagine and keep that image of the vicious cycle and how we can break it in mind, that would be a really, really important thing. So let me now come back to autism for, for the rest of the presentation. Um, a very common question I get asked is people saying, so how common is autism? Because it seems to be getting more and more and more, more common. Is the whole world going to have autism in the end? And on the one hand, it's true. If you look at the rates in the 1970s, in fact, when I was in medical school now, fortunately it wasn't in the 1970s, um, but I was taught that about one in 10,000 children probably had autism. And gradually, as research and knowledge and evidence increased, the rates have been going up and up and up. And in 2018, a study in the US showed one in 59 children had met criteria for autism spectrum disorder. One in 34 of the boys in that particular um, um, CDC study. A study in Korea showed one in 38 children in schools met criteria for an, for an autism spectrum disorder. Now, Epidemiological studies always have variation. And I think if we put all the different studies together um, and we look at them put together, the, the current estimates are that autism probably is at least 1% and maybe up to 2% of the population. So it means that autism and autism spectrum disorders are at least as common as schizophrenia, which has a, a prevalence of 1%. So just a word then, I think it's useful to remember the at least 1%, which means we know very little about a condition that's actually much more common than we think. A uh, bit of historical background, autism first described by a man called Leo Connor, uh, developmental pediatrician, or no, actually he was the first child, one of the early child psychiatrists in the, U in the US um, in 1943. Um, and he described 11 children happiest when they're on their own, oblivious to things around them, a mania for spinning toys, shaking head side to side, tantrums when routines were disrupted. And in the following year, a man called um, Hans Asperger in Austria described four gifted but withdrawn boys. He said they didn't have empathy, um, they had little ability to form friendships, they had, were very one-sided in their conversations, they had a very particular absorption in certain things. And because they came across as so kind of pedantic and adult-like, he called them his little professors. And over time, people have separated autism, Asperger's, and what used to be called pervasive developmental disorders, not otherwise specified, or PDD, you might have heard the term PDD. In DSM-5, we have changed and we are grouping all those conditions in the same box, as I will illustrate to you now. This is the way I try to remember 
how to diagnose autism spectrum disorders. Some people think it looks a bit like a windmill, whatever your analogy is for what it looks like, you will see that there are two overlapping circles. In the one circle, there are three arrows. In the other circle, there are four, and there's a red one in the middle. And the simple message, and before I show you the, the words that go with the arrows, is that there are two main domains in which we look for abnormalities in autism. And to meet criteria for autism, we need to have problems in each of those two domains. So you need to be here in the middle. You need to have an overlap, some in each domain. In domain one, you need to have, we need to identify challenges in each of these three. There are three subdomains. And in domain B, in the second domain, we need to find difficulties in two of the four of those arrows, if that makes sense. Let me put some words to this so you can see if it makes sense. DSM-5, we look for persistent impairment in reciprocal social communication and social interactions across multiple contexts. And we look for restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. We need to see evidence in early childhood. Remember, this is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So if somebody has no problems and suddenly at the age of 13 they start or at the age of 25, that's not a neurodevelopmental disorder. That's probably something else. And we need to see evidence of impairment in their daily life, in their functioning. Let me add more words to it. In this domain one and domain two, here you can see the three subdomains. Domain one, we are looking for difficulties with socio-emotional reciprocity. And I will give some examples in a minute. We're looking for problems in non-verbal communication used to interact socially. And we're looking for difficulties in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. On the second, in the second domain, we look for two of, do you remember I said two of those four arrows? Stereotyped or repetitive movements, use of objects or speech. Insistence on sameness, this exact phrase comes from Kahner when he described it in 1943, being very inflexibly adhering to routines, being very ritualized, either in your verbal or nonverbal behavior having highly particular fixated interests and or having sensory hypo or hypersensitivity. We don't have time to go into lots of examples and for those interested to learn more about autism, I'm gonna suggest you can look at some of the, the references in the literature that I will give you at the end. But just a few examples in each of those three subdomains um, of that first circle that I've shown you. In social emotional reciprocity, we're really looking for difficulties in the normal to and fro of social relationship. You know, if you think about how do I interact with other people, um, there's a to and fro. I see and you nod, I speak and you add, we play and we take turns. And so that's socio emotional reciprocity. And in autism, this is a major problem for most people. So we might see unusual social approach. So people might have unusual overtures of the way they approach you. They might use somebody else's body as a tool, for instance, to take them and lead them to things. Um, they might struggle with to and fro conversation. It might all be either one-sided or not at all, or a monologue and not picking up that others want to speak. They might be reduced sharing of interests or emotions, um, for instance, showing or directing attention, offering to share, sharing or seeking enjoyment with other people. Or people may not initiate or respond to social interaction. So either not showing an interest in other children or other people, or not quite knowing how to respond when other people approach them, or doing it in an odd way. In the domain of nonverbal communication, here we're now looking to see how do people communicate using their nonverbal tools. And so, for instance, we might see a poor integration between words and gestures or eye contact, for instance. Or we may see people struggling to use their eye gaze in an integrated, socially comfortable way. We might see problems with their, how they use gestures, their facial expressions to regulate social interactions. So for instance, they're smiling or having a limited range or just using it in, in odd ways to communicate. And we may also see that people struggle to understand and use gestures. So there's one component about their own, Difficulty, and then another is about reading similar things in others. So not pointing, for instance, to express an interest in something, nodding, head shaking, um, 
different kinds of gestures, the kind of thing that you see me do all the time. This is called an emphatic gesture. And often people in, with autism don't use gestures in this kind of typical way. And the third subdomain here is about developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. And so it's about not adjusting your behavior to others, perhaps asking inappropriate questions or making inappropriate facial expressions, not quite knowing how to share in play, either not playing or wanting to play in the same way um, or not wanting to take different roles in play um, or even an absence of interest in peers. Some, some children with autism may avoid other children and might hide behind mum and dad if they see other children approaching. Um, the key thing is in this domain, as well as the next domain we're going to look at briefly, that it looks different for every child with an autism spectrum disorder. So there's not one blueprint or recipe. And that's why I think it will be useful for you to go and look up and read up more about ASD. So just a few words then about that second circle. We've looked at the one circle, now the second one. We may see stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or of speech. So you might see children flicking their fingers when they get excited or tippy-toeing or twirling around when either when they're very excited or when they get very distressed, for instance, by something. They might line up their toys rather than play with them. They might flip things. They might open and close things. They might take a car and rather than pushing it around saying vroom, 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 they might turn it around and spin the wheels or open and close the doors, for instance. Um, that's what we mean by repetitive use of objects or interest in only parts of objects. And in terms of language, we might see echolalia. So this is repeating words or phrases that they've just heard, immediate echolalia, or delayed echolalia, where a child or a person might use a phrase, a chunk that they've heard, maybe somebody else's language or on television or in an advertisement or from a book, and use it repeatedly. People might even make up their own and have odd language, have um, what we call um, neologisms, words they've made up, um, or just use unusual expressions. Insistence on sameness, this lovely phrase from Kana, is about people often having extreme distress at small changes, difficulty with transitions, very rigid thinking patterns, they might have very particular greeting rituals, take the same route, eat the same food, and even just having a different kind of white bread might be a problem, or having the salt and pepper there on the table rather than there, or having a different plate might be problematic and might lead to significant difficulties for people. In terms of highly restricted or fixated interest, often here we see people having a very particular interest. Now, all of us might have a hobby that's about sport or about toys or cars or whatever, but in autism, we see that the intensity is extreme and we see that it is to the social exclusion of others. When you or I are in a club with other people and we talk about football or rugby or activities or dinosaurs, we do it because we like to share with one another. If we have autism and we have this highly restricted interest, we may do it because we're interested in it for ourselves, in the facts. It's not because we want to share it, for instance. And people might also show what we call preoccupations with unusual objects. So this is being interested in unusual things like sticks and twigs and or wanting to look for toilet seats or radiators or wall plugs or all sorts of unusual things that might give us an example that this is something unusual or odd that we don't expect in typical development. You remember that very early slide I showed that we may see delay or deficit or we may see oddity. And here we may see an example of an unusual kind of interest in behavior. And the fourth domain which was added in DSM-5 is many people with autism might be either hypo or hypersensitive to particular sensory stimuli. So that might be the sight, the smell, the look, or the feel of something. They might either really like the sight, the smell, the look, or feel, or they may be very sensitive to the sight, the smell, the look, the feel of particular things. And they can lead to very significant impairments in daily life for many people. When we diagnose autism now, uh, do you remember I mentioned we used to say Asperger, autism, we now only diagnose one box. We say that you have an autism spectrum disorder and we define the severity level of your autism based on that social communication domain and on the repetitive and, and stereotype behavior domain. 
Oh, so we may say you have autism with significant difficulties in social communication and moderate difficulties in um, stereotyping and repetitive behaviors. And we might say, and you have autism and intellectual disability or without intellectual disability, with a language or without a language disorder, with a known medical or genetic condition or without, with another neurodevelopmental or mental or behavioral disorder or without. So you can see we list to be more descriptive because we know that autism is such a broad thing. Um, simply knowing that you meet criteria for ASD doesn't tell us very much about what your interventional needs may be. And that's why we define severity and we use specifiers to help us with clinical intervention planning. So I hope that you will now understand my little umbrella or fan or lollipop or whatever you might want to call it, that autism is two main domains with three subdomains in social affect, four subdomains in repetitive and stereotype behaviors. We need to have difficulties in each of those three and we need to have difficulties in two of the four in order to say somebody has an autism spectrum disorder. And the key thing for all of us to remember, none of those behaviors examples that we have just talked about on their own are sufficient for us to say somebody has ASD. Any one of us might have some of those difficulties at some point in our lives. Um, I might have sensory sensitivities. You might have had difficulties with eye contact. Somebody else might have had um, problems with play, etc. So none of them on their own are enough to say, or is enough to say, I have ASD. That's why we need a diagnostic process that in a systematic way works through all of these and then adds it up to say, yes, you do, or no, you don't meet the criteria for autism. Let me now shift to the red flags for autism because they are related, but not quite the same as diagnostic features of autism. But let me first take a step back and tell you why people became interested in finding and promoting red flags or risk markers for autism. Across the globe, all over the world, and it's still very much the case in Africa and in most low middle income countries where most people with autism lived, um, we realized that mums and dads and caregivers and aunties and uncles and grannies and grandpas typically pick up some concerns early on. Usually by about the age of two, Mum would say, I'm worried about my child's development. Mum might say, Gran might say, he's not yet saying words. Why is that? And what we typically see is that all over the world, from parental concern or family concern to diagnosis and actually starting some intervention, there's a gap of at least two years, if not more. So if you're worried at the age of two about your child, Typically, they are not going to see a specialist or a doctor who will diagnose or might diagnose autism or language or other disorder until they are four or even five. And that age, between the age of two and three or four, is the ideal time for us to start early intervention. And so red flags and risk markers were identified through large-scale research over many years and are being communicated and we are teaching the world about it so that we can try and reduce that gap from concern to doing something. And you will see when I show you the red, the red flags or risk markers that they are things that typically developing children do very early on, in the first few years of life. And the message to all of us is whatever kind of job we do, whether we are child psychiatrists, whether we are orthopedic surgeons, whether we're general practitioners, whether we're mums or dads or nurses in a clinic, if we see any of these red flags, it should make us think, aha, should I think about autism? Should I seek an assessment for autism? Or should I even start some basic supportive work to help this family who may have a child with autism or another neurodevelopmental disorder? So here are the red flags and I'll just quickly show them to you. Number one is not responding to name by 12 months. From very early on, babies, if you call their name, will orient towards you. They will look towards you and often they will then smile. They'll make eye contact and smile. If a child doesn't respond to their name by a year, that's a red flag. 
if they don't point at objects to show interest, mommy, look, and usually they look back to see if you're looking where they're pointing. By 14 months, it's a very typical developmental milestone. If children don't do that, it's a red flag. Not having pretend play by 18 months. Pretend play could be anything from, you know, rocking a little baby or pushing the car or pretending to make tea and feeding people and changing nappies or any kinds of things that might be culturally appropriate. But if by 18 months children don't do that, it's a red flag. Avoiding eye contact, wanting to be alone is a red flag. Um, because children, most of us are social creatures. We are we use our eyes to engage with people and we want to be with other people because that's how we learn. We are social learners in the world. If young children have trouble understanding other people's feelings or trouble talking about their own, that's a red flag. Delayed speech and language skills is a very important red flag and it's the most common red flag that typically is why families would go to, to a clinic to a doctor, to a nurse saying, I'm worried he's too, he's not yet saying words. And what we don't want doctors to do is to say, don't worry, he's just a boy, come back in a year if he's not improved. This is the time we want you to start intervention, not delay. Repeating words and phrases over and over, do you remember I mentioned echolalia? Um, so that could be a red flag for autism. Giving answers unrelated to questions. So if it really doesn't feel as though there's a conversation, so, um, between a child and a parent. And if you think, where did that come from? It has nothing to do with what we're trying to talk about at the moment. Getting upset by minor changes in routines, having very obsessional interests, flapping hands, body rocking, spinning in circles. Those are motor red flags. And also you remember I mentioned unusual reaction to sound, smell, taste, look or feel. Often children show it by, you know, if it's sound putting their hands and they get us distressed or anxious, but sometimes people also have idiosyncratic responses to sensory stimuli, and that usually makes them angry. And it could be unusual things like the sound of a dog barking, the sound of um, a baby crying, the look of beards, um, all sorts of things can lead to these unusual reactions. So you can see some of them also linked to diagnostic criteria, but these are the key red flags or risk markers you want to read more about them look at the CDC website but remember each one of them should make us think could there be autism and or another neurodevelopmental disorder and the more we see the more likely a child is to have an autism spectrum disorder or other neurodevelopmental disability. Let me wrap up and just say two words about intervention for autism very often and probably until 10 or 20 years ago, many people believed that there was nothing we could do to treat autism. And the one message that we should all remember is that there is now very clear evidence that we can treat autism and we can treat autism, including the core deficits, those things in those, in those two domains that I showed you, we can treat most of those things and we can help children to develop language, to become turn takers, to engage in the social world, to reduce some of those difficult or unwanted behaviors. But the key is we need to pick these things up and we need to intervene as early as we can. It's never too late, but the earlier, the better. We don't have time to go into details of intervention and I'm just going to leave you with kind of 10 core principles for intervention for autism and in fact, principles on the whole will apply to most neurodevelopmental disorders. But in autism specifically, principle number one is that we need a comprehensive assessment to guide comprehensive intervention. You've seen there are so many different components just in autism that we need to look for and each person with autism is going to look different and therefore their, their profile of needs will be different. Number two, by definition no single intervention will work for everyone. So if anybody's trying to sell you a particular treatment, a particular pill, a particular therapy, and say, this will be the solution to all the problems, by definition, they're probably wrong. Some things work for some, but not all things work for all. The third thing we are going to do is we are going to accommodate the challenges of people with autism. This is what I mean by um, Simon Baron-Cohen, well-known British autism expert, uses the word mind blindness. 
And he says that many people with autism struggle to understand and read the minds of others. And so imagine you have a blind child at home. If you have a fancy coffee table and things that can break, you will accommodate your blind child by moving those things away. And in exactly the same way, we're going to make the world a more autism friendly place. We're going to use simple language, straightforward language. We're going to be clear. We're going to produce, create structure. We can help um, create scheduling for people. We're going to be very deliberate in helping them teach and motivating them for communication and so on. So that's what we mean by accommodate. But we are also going to build skills through the core difficulties of autism. And as I just said, there's a whole world of intervention that have opened up that can help us build skills through the core deficits of autism. We're also going to look for and treat the conditions that co-occur with autism. Do you remember how I said neurodevelopmental disorders co-occur with one another, with physical health problems, with mental health problems? And so we're going to look for and treat those things because they might be just as important to treat as the autism itself. Number six, we're going to be family focused. We are going to do nothing without family participation and without making sure that we understand the needs and the priorities of the family. A child and an adolescent with autism live their lives with their families and they only come to a clinic every once in a while. So nobody knows a child with autism and with any neurodevelopmental disability better than their family. And so we need to work with the family, support the family, empower the family, give them skills and tools. And you will see also increasingly, also when you go and read more, that increasingly our interventional strategies are based at finding strategies to teach families to work with their children with autism. We're going to use early intervention in the early years and early identification and treatment throughout the lifespan because some of these conditions might occur throughout the lifespan. We're going to understand the meaning of behaviors. We don't have time to talk about it today, but children with autism and other disabilities often present with what people might call challenging behaviors, behaviors that challenge others. And rather than to say this is a difficult child or a naughty child, we're going to ask ourselves, what is this child trying to communicate to me when they bang their head, when they hit out, when they spit, when they shout? And once we understand the meaning, the function of that behavior, then it will guide us to the right treatment or intervention. We're going to use evidence-based interventions, not random things, not things that don't have evidence and not things that might be dangerous or harmful to people with autism or other disabilities. And the mainstay focus nowadays is we do parent education and training to empower families, to give them knowledge and skills. And we use what we call naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions or NDBIs. And it's a whole field of interventions that work in the natural context, in the natural setting, at home, during daily activities, during usual things, to build interventional strategies into that. We've moved away from the approach where a child is sent into a therapy room with one therapist, because the risk is that that doesn't generalize into the real world. And it is in the real world that we want people with autism and other disabilities to be able to function, to participate, and to be seen as citizens with equal rights and equal um, visibility as anyone else in the world. Further reading, as I said, this is a brief introduction and there are many, many, many other things you can go and read. Here are a few freely available resources. So anyone can go and look for them and download them and read. The Yakapep, so the International Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists and Allied Professions has an e-textbook. Here it is, just Google it. You can download chapters, you can download the whole book and it covers the whole range of child and adolescent mental health conditions. Yakapep also has some MOOCs. So these are massively online open courses and um, videos where Experts like me would be talking about particular conditions. So for those who like watching little movies, there are movies to watch. Goodman and Scott, um, Robert Goodman from the UK and um, uh, Stephen Scott also from the UK, wrote a textbook, a very nice accessible textbook in child and lesson psychiatry. And this too is freely downloadable um, through um, the internet and you can find that. And for those who are particularly interested in finding out a bit more about autism and those early markers, what autism looks like in very young people. There's a wonderful resource um, online called the Autism Navigator, developed by 
Dr. Amy Weatherby and colleagues at the Florida State University. And what you can do is you can go to the website, register, you have to register, but then you can have access to a free training module on what a typically developing two-year-old might look like when they play, when you talk to them, when you call their name, and right next to it, what a child with autism might look like when you call their name, you give them toys, they play, they interact. And it's a great resource to give us a sense of how these things can differ quantitatively, but also just the kind of quality of how autism might look different. Highly recommended to any of you who might be um, interested to learn more about early markers of autism. With that, I'm going to stop and wrap it up. And I sincerely hope that this was a useful overview to you on neurodevelopmental disorders, a bird's eye view. And I hope that if nothing else, it's at least made you realize, one, the importance of neurodevelopmental disabilities um, in all settings, but particularly in low and middle income settings. And number two, hopefully I've stimulated your interest to go and read and Google and search a little bit more about autism or about any or all of these other neurodevelopmental disorders. Thank you very much. <laughs>